The nervous system is divided into two basic divisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, the CNS and the PNS. The central nervous system being the brain and the spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system is literally everything else, all other nervous tissue. So that is the two basic divisions. Now from there, we can make two divisions of the peripheral nervous system. The motor division, which controls what we refer to as effectors, things that act, and the sensory division, which is amazingly enough, things that sense. So sensory structures. Think your eyeball, think uh, hairs that can sense the movement of wind, that sort of thing, temperature, all your senses. Those are part of the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system. Now you can see we have arrows showing that the sensory nervous system goes to the central nervous system. These are uh, Afferent circuits, so afferent means it's going to the central nervous system. Whereas if it's moving away from the central nervous system, our arrows in blue go into the motor division. Those are efferent. Efferent systems exit. E for exit the nervous system, the central nervous system. So uh, those are some basic vocab bits. The motor division can be separated further into two basic bits. The voluntary somatic nervous system, so voluntary junk. This is essentially your skeletal muscle. Where at, well, uh, controlling your skeletal muscle. Uh, whereas the autonomic nervous system is stuff that can, is involuntary, stuff not under conscious control. So autonomic means not under conscious control. So that means that it is stuff that you do not control. I'm repeating myself. That's great. Uh, we can divide the autonomic nervous system further into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division. Um, and this is about ramping up activity or ramping down activity. So the sympathetic nervous system is something you might recognize under the concept of the fight or flight response. However, it is the fight, flight, or freeze response, which is really freeze and assess. Um, this is preparing you for activity. The parasympathetic division is ramping down activity and preparing you for rest, often referred to as the rest and digest circuit. So that is the nervous system there. So now for some basic neuron anatomy. Um, the basic neuron, the most common neuron in the central nervous system is this standard multipolar neuron in which we have a cell body containing the nucleus and all the organelles. Then, uh, of course, there's the nucleus, then extensions off of the cell body, multiple branching extensions called dendrites. These, uh, ha uh, at each dendrite, we have junctions with other neurons. Specifically, axons of other neurons. Speaking of, uh, over here, we have the tail. First, there's this sort of bit there called the axon hillock. Uh, 
axon hillock is essentially where the cell body uh, becomes the axon, the long tail of the neuron. So there's the axon hillock connecting into what we'd call the initial segment of the axon, with the rest of it being the axon. Axon, axon, ha ha ha, um, okay, so this is the axon, the long tail. Here are the axon terminals. The axon terminals are what we actually uh, have when we make junctions to dendrites. Uh, and then we have myelin, which is fatty insulating bits, this blue stuff over the axon. And then between myelin bits, we have tiny bits of exposed neuron called the node of Ranvier in singular uh, Ranvier. I don't know how French you're supposed to get with it. Let's go Ranvier. That sounds real fancy. So um, that's your basic multipolar neuron. Uh, this is the most common cell in the nervous system. Uh, and it is essentially the default when we talk about a neuron. There's several other configurations. Uh, you'll note when we're talking about the central nervous system, we'll be most likely using the term neuron. In the peripheral nervous system, we tend to use the word nerve. This is because most of the nervous tissue you find in the peripheral nervous system is axon, right? So say you've got a sensor at your fingertip, right? There's a finger. Uh, and it eventually has to go through your entire hand, whatever. That's enough of a hand. And then through your arm, that's enough of an arm, elbow. Uh, shoulder, and then eventually to your spinal cord, right? So you have your touch sensor here. We'll just, this is our pretend touch sensor. You know what? No, that does not work. Okay, so we'll have a fine touch sensor here, which is essentially dendrites. Little things attached to dendrites. So here's our dendrites that are connected to the sensory structure. And then you have a cell body and then you have an axon. And the axon is going to connect all the way down. And you can see that uh, nearly all of the nervous tissue here is devoted to axon. And then over here, there's a little bit of another neuron sort of saying, hey, what's up? and uh, it will connect up to neurons in the spinal cord. Uh, and so you can see most of this is axon. So when we refer to a nerve, what we're generally referring to is the axons that go from sensory to spinal cord or from spinal cord to effector, muscle or gland, right? Uh, so. This is a sensory or afferent nerve. Uh, when we talk about nerves, very rarely uh, will you have just a single axon. And when in where you have a single axon, it is a very short distance. Very quickly, multiple axons from multiple neurons connect together. Uh, and so you will have a nerve representing a large number of axons. So a single nerve represents a large number of axons. And indeed, it can represent bundles of axons going both directions. So here I'll do blue and have my motor neurons. So here's some motor neurons connecting up to uh, the muscle of various parts of the body, right? And so they're bundled together. Uh, so there we go. A nerve is essentially a large bundle of axons.
So when you look, we have multiple sheets surrounding multiple axons. So here is a single sheath around one single axon, and there's the myelin around a single axon. And then you bundle together hundreds to thousands of these axons into a sheath, and then bundle multiple sheaths together, and then bundle them around you know, blood vessels, and they travel with blood vessels. Uh, and so, uh, well, they travel along the same path of blood vessels. So nerves are actually referring to bundles of axons, whereas neuron is referring to the cell proper. So the reason why uh, we tend to talk about nerves in the peripheral nervous system is because, again, most of the peripheral nervous system is devoted to nerves, with very little of it being the cell body and dendrites. Uh, whereas in the brain, these multipolar neurons are extremely dense, occurring by the hundreds of billions, so probably trillions. Uh, okay, so we have the epineurium, the outer sheath of the nerve. Then we have the perineurium, so epineurium is the outer sheath of the entire bundle. The perineurium is a sheath of nerves, uh, of, of a smaller amount of nerves. Uh, and then we have the endoneurium, the endoneurium being a sheath around a single axon. So uh, these are the sheaths covering it. So much like we learned about how muscles have sheaths, nerves have sheaths. All right, now let's talk about neuroglia. These are the non-nerve cells that support the central nervous system. And then there's uh, two neuroglia uh, worth mentioning in the peripheral nervous system. So in the central nervous system, we have uh, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, the microglial cells, and the ependymal cells. Uh, let's just pop over to the astrocytes. We'll go back in a moment, but let's just keep ourselves on a trajectory here. The astrocytes are star-shaped cells with diverse functions. You can see what they have are these extensions. So they have multiple extensions uh, from the cell. And these extensions do different things depending on what type of cell they are connected to. So you can see some of these extensions wrap around nerves or neurons. And some of these extensions wrap around capillaries. So here's capillaries. And these are... Uh, dendrites or axons. And essentially, they do a couple of things. One, they help maintain structural support. Essentially, they, uh, they help to keep tight uh, supported junctions. In other words, they help keep circuits functional, right? If you've got uh, a neuron here and it needs to sort of go around in a little thing and then it has as little terminal buds, not to scale. And then you have another neuron there and it needs to go one way and a neuron here, and that needs to go a different way, and this neuron, which has to go another different way, right? You might have glial cells there to help hold these connections in place. So uh, 
All right, so they will help keep the structure in the right spot. There you go. So you can see there's a little glial cell helping to maintain that structure, keep uh, junctions well supported, keep neurons tightly connected, right? That's for a good. And that's part of help guiding uh, neurons to make connections. Uh, okay. They also regulate extracellular potassium, right? So in order to properly function, a neuron needs to have a gradient of potassium concentration inside the neuron versus outside. And that gradient is high on the inside, right? So you have the cell and your extracellular potassium must be low concentration outside and high concentration inside. We need a gradient to properly control potassium in order to properly function here. So the astrocyte can take in potassium or excrete potassium into the extracellular space, the, the extracellular matrix here, in order to keep extracellular potassium at the correct concentrations. Astrocytes can also recycle neurotransmitters. Uh, once neurons have secreted neurotransmitters, they do not immediately reabsorb directly into the neuron. So astrocytes can reuptake those neurotransmitters and recycle them. Uh, and they can also recycle degraded neurons themselves. So they can break down neurons that are degraded. A oh, part of your brain's normal maintenance is uh, breaking circuits and rebuilding circuits. And that can also involve breaking down and recycling old or degraded neurons. So they will phagocytose uh, degraded neurons, not uh, too terrible. Uh, now, the last one is a big deal, and that's uh, capillary permanent permeability. Okay, so, so biophagocytosis. Let me get a couple of things in here. Neurotransmitter reuptake. Uh, so this is just um, uh, absorb and recycle, uh, regulate extracellular potassium, uh, that's to maintain the concentration gradient. And we've already talked about how they help support the structure there. Capillary permeability is a big deal. If you look at this picture here, there is no exposed capillary, right? Uh, this astrocyte forms the blood-brain barrier. Essentially, uh, capillaries cannot immediately excrete stuff out. So diffusion from capillaries are out to the neurons. So capillary diffusion goes to astrocytes first. Astrocytes filter blood. Astrocytes filter blood. They are a essentially barrier between blood and nervous tissue. This is rather important. Uh, you don't want anything from the blood to easily escape into the brain and then potentially affect every cell in the brain. So basically how this works is we have a uh, so we have essentially capillary material, right? So uh, we have gases and nutrients. Uh, 
all right, in capillary. And from the capillary, they go, they diffuse to the astrocytes. First and foremost, everything diffuses to astrocytes. And astrocytes will regulate whether or not something gets from the capillary to the uh, rest of the brain or not. So uh, if it doesn't, it goes, you know, essentially diffused back into the blood. Astrocyte regulates. It is semi-permeable. It regulates uh, nutrient transfer or whatever. Right, so if it makes it past the astrocytes, it goes to the CSF, which is the cerebrospinal fluid, which is going to serve kind of a similar function to blood because uh, essentially we don't get this extracellular fluid, right? The plasma and the diffusion products within it. Uh, the rest of the body, when stuff exits the capillaries, it exits in fluid, right, from the blood. So a mixture of plasma and ever other stuff, the exudate. Um, and uh, that's taken up by the lymphatic system, so on and so forth. Here, uh, that doesn't happen because whatever ha uh, exits the capillaries goes to the astrocyte first. So, without an exudate leaving the capillary, uh, things have to travel in a fluid, and that is the cerebrospinal fluid. We'll talk about that with the ependymal cells. But if it makes it through the astrocytes to the cerebrospinal fluid, it can then diffuse to the nervous tissue. All our neurons. Right? Uh, and then we can run this in reverse for uh, having waste exit the brain. Uh, so, ta-da! Astrocytes, very important function. Okay, on to the microglia. The microglia are resident macrophages. So they're near blood vessels in the brain and they do what macrophages do, right? They are big eaters. They phagocytose bacteria, and they remove debris from the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so that could be, you know, uh, stuff secreted by bacteria, that could be wastes from uh, metabol um, so this could be metabolic wastes. Uh, this could be uh, secretions or excretions from bacteria. Uh, secretions is for glands. Bacteria are single cells, so let's give it. So excretions uh, of foreign cells. Um, and it could be, uh, you know, like um, degraded uh, apoptosis. Uh, so apoptosis debris. I keep saying apoptosis just because it's lazier. Um, I'm sure if you found someone stuffy in British, they'd say apoptosis. Okay. Uh, all right. My wife just yelled from another room, it's apoptosis, because the cell pops. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually a pretty good mnemonic. So um, I'm not gonna stop saying apoptosis because it's just faster. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna grind to a halt on that second P. Apoptosis slows me way down. Okay, so oligodendrocytes. Uh, oligodendrocytes are a specialized cell of the central nervous system. So, so far, all of these cells, the glial cells, are part of the central nervous system. Uh, so, these are accessory cells 
of the central nervous system, non-neural cells that support the central nervous system. Oligodendrocytes create those myelin sheaths that we saw on the axons. So an axon, right, actually has multiple myelin sheaths on it. And the oligodendrocytes are the ones responsible for putting those multiple myelin sheaths on the axon. Essentially, they kind of look like astrocytes. They have these cellular extensions, these cytoplasmic uh, uh, cytoskeletal extensions. Um, and the cytoskeletal extensions uh, push outward, connect up to a neuron, and then the big deal is that they form a spiraling sheath. So you can really see it on this one here. Uh, it basically just rolls its extension around a portion of axon, literally just like a fruit roll up or something, rolls it up. So it rolls uh, fat around the axon. Essentially what we have here uh, is portions of the cytoplasm with essentially little to no organelles. Uh, and because it's rolled up, so it rolls fat around the axon. And where does that fat come from? Well, the rolling is actually important for that. See, uh, this rolled bit here, this fruit roll-up bit, it's essentially uh, free of organelles it's kind of just like cytoplasm, empty, we'll just put empty in quotes there, cytoplasm. And so the main portion in this area is literally just layers of the phospholipid membrane. And so we have these tight layers of phospholipid membrane with little to no organelles. It's basically empty cytoplasm. And amazingly enough, right there in the name, lipid, the phospholipid, uh, whoops. Stop it. No, I didn't want to. Oh, man. Uh, whoops, this will get cut. Stupid thing. Uh, where's the stupid button? Slideshow. Not from the beginning. No, oh, not subtitles. Show presenter view, click the button, click the button, and then don't show presenter view. Okay, so we have these tight layers of phospholipid membrane right in the name. We have lipid, which means we essentially have layer upon layer of fat. So the myelin sheath is fatty. Uh, it's a fatty sheath because of membranes. Uh, it's fatty due to tons, that's the scientific term, tons of phospholipid membrane. So, uh, that's that. All right, uh, so continuing forward, upward, onward to the ependymal cells, the last type of glial cell in the central nervous system. Uh, ependymal cells are found in one place in the ventricles of the brain. Uh, so when you look at a brain, 
right? Uh, the brain is divided into like a a left and a right hemisphere, although this would be anatomical position. So this would be there, a left and a right hemisphere. And if you look inside the brain structure itself, you will find ventricles, which are essentially a series of sort of hollow fluid filled canals. So um, they're just inside the brain uh, and they connect to uh, different portions of the brain Sure, why not? Uh, and then they actually proceed uh, into a central canal that travels down the spinal cord. So these are our hollow, put that in quotes, because they are technically fluid filled. Um, canals? Uh, canals and I don't know, man, cisterns, that's a good term. Oh God, and there goes my pen. So fluid filled canals and cisterns uh, that essentially, that's all I need there Ventra, uh, for this slide. So I can finish out the slide. Okay. so. Um, they are part of the central canal of the spinal cord and the ventricles of the brain, and they have one basic job, and that's to help form cerebrospinal fluid, which is the diffusion system for getting nutrients around the brain and metabolic wastes around the brain. Uh, and not only do they contribute to the formation of it, they contribute to the flow of it, as you can see from all the cilia here. So they help move CSF and they help contribute to its formation. Ooh, okay. We were talking about the ependymal cells and how they uh, are located in the ventricle of the brain uh, and the central canal of the spinal cord and their role is to contribute to the formation of cerebrospinal fluid and using their cilia to circulate that cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, okay, so moving forward, we have the neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system neuroglia uh, are uh, pretty cool. So there are two basic types here. We have the Schwann cells and we have the satellite cells. Okay, so what do the Schwann cells do? Uh, the Schwann cells produce the myelin sheath. Uh, so that is a very important function there. Uh, it's also worth emphasizing that the, uh, the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system has nothing to do with uh, the <clears throat> oligodendrocytes. It is only associated with the Schwann cells. Uh, the Schwann cells also produce uh, the neurolemma, which is uh, essentially a, uh, an extremely thin sheath around the axon. So uh, the neurolemma and the myelin. Schwann cells are slightly different from our, uh, our oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes 
produced these cytoplasmic extensions that wrapped around the uh, the axon. And so one oligodendrocyte could produce multiple myelin sheaths across multiple different axons from multiple nerves, neurons. So uh, whereas with a Schwann cell, it is one cell to one segment of sheath. So that myelin sheath bit right there, this is one Schwann cell. Uh, very important to note. Um, you can actually see uh, blah, 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 blah. show presenter view, click here, and here. You can actually see how this works uh, because the cell itself curls around the axon. So the cell itself, the Schwann cell, uh, makes a, an initial curl and then, just like with the oligodendrocytes, starts to spiral itself around. And so these portions closest to the axon, these are essentially just layer upon layer of phospholipid membrane. And that's how we have a fatty myelin sheath here with it just being a single cell. So we only find like organelles and such on the outermost layer. Uh, and the inner layers are all just literally extremely thin pressed sections of phospholipid bilayer and empty cytoplasm. So Schwann cell envelops an axon, rotates around the axon, forming layers, and the cytoplasm is forced from between the tightly wrapped layers, forming the myelin sheath, and a molecular interaction uh, just holds the layers together. So uh, it doesn't unwind due to a little molecular interaction. Sometimes you could refer to it as like a sort of molecular Velcro. Uh, not uh, the most uh, anatomical of descriptions there, um, but there you go. Uh, whereas we can compare myelination in the central nervous system uh, with those oligodendrocytes, um, where it's literally the same idea, tightly wrapped spiraled layers with those little uh, Velcro bits, but a, a, lingo, a single oligodendrocyte can wrap around segments of 60 different axons. So one oligodendrocyte can do significantly more myelination uh, when you think about it, because one Schwann cell, one section of myelination. One oligodendrocyte, 60 diff up to 60 different myelination bits. So lots and lots and lots of myelination. This makes sense. You have extremely limited space in the central nervous system. You do not want to have to have a single cell myelinating, myelinating every bit of axon there. You need uh, efficiency. So uh, that is what the oligodendrocytes offer is efficiency. Uh, okay, so. Mm -hmm. Pop back over to our satellite cell. Our satellite cell is essentially these little overlapping, Ooh, come back here. Our satellite cells are little overlapping uh, cells. So here's a satellite cell. Uh, and these are overlapping cells. And they create a barrier, a diffusion barrier. So this way we have capillaries and then nutrients and gases. So nutrients and gases in the capillaries diffuse Ooh, 
diffuase. They diffuse into the exudate, uh, well, the, the extracellular fluid. Hey, come back here. What? Come back. So the extracellular fluid. Uh, and then they diffuse into the satellite cell. And then the satellite cell determines uh, what can filter into the actual peripheral nerve cell, peripheral neuron. So uh, filters to the peripheral neuron right there. And then metabolic waste from the peripheral neuron filter out of the satellite cell and then into the extracellular fluid and so on. So uh, again, we just have a layer of protection so that uh, things from the blood are never just directly uh, diffusing into these neurons, which is good. This, amongst other things, provides a potent immune function, right? This is a potent, whether it's the astrocytes creating the blood-brain barrier or the satellite cells creating the peripheral nervous system barrier, right? This is a potent immune barrier. That's probably one of its most important things, and it's a potent... Uh, uh, a potent um, preventer of toxic concentrations. So prevents toxic buildups of chemicals, whatever, X. So uh, by filtering, they can prevent pathogenic uh, chemicals or even bacteria themselves from getting into the nervous system. Uh, and they can also sort of take the toxins themselves and prevent toxins from damaging your nervous tissue. So that's a rather big deal. So uh, now let's talk about the electrical function of the nervous system. All right, so uh, you might have heard the term, uh, you know, the, the idea that your brain works on electricity. Um, and it's very fundamentally, uh, it, it's a fundamentally different sort of concept than the electrical movement, uh, like electron-based interactions that you get in actual human synthesized electrical stuff, right? We're not talking about the same electricity. Uh, here, what we're talking about is charge across a membrane. So essentially, we have a charge on the exterior of the membrane and a charge on the interior of a membrane. And a difference, a differential charge across a membrane is called a potential. More than that, a differential charge across a membrane is also polarity. So what is the differential charge in a neuron? Well, a neuron maintains different charges based on activity. When a neuron is not active, right? If you've seen movies or whatever, you'll see a little light traveling along a neuron for when it's active, when it's firing an impulse. Uh, when it is not doing that, it is a neuron at rest. And so it has its own resting membrane potential. And that resting membrane potential is 
negative 70 millivolts. That does not mean the inside of a neuron is negatively charged. That means that the inside, so the inner membrane is 70 millivolts lower than the outer surface of the membrane. The charge difference between the outside and the inside of the membrane is 70 millivolts, with it being lower inside. So it is negative 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential, the resting charge difference across the membrane is negative 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential. So the potential difference across the plasma membrane, negative 70 millivolts, millivolts in neurons. With the cytoplasmic side, negative or lower in charge than the exterior side. Not too bad. So this is generated through a number of different things. Uh, we have differences in ionic concentration. Uh, of the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. So different ions uh, and ion concentrations in intracellular fluid ICF versus extracellular fluid e c f right so um so that's one way we have our differential charge right uh differences in calcium potassium sodium and various other ions and different concentrations outside versus inside and then we also have differential permeability of the plasma membrane. In other words, uh, um, how, whether or not, or when ions can diffuse across the membrane. In other words, the membrane may be able to block some ions completely from flowing across the membrane. It may be able to regulate how easily ions flow across the membrane. If it has a lower permeability, the ion flow is slower, and so that will lend to a uh, difference in charge. And it may be able to affect that permeability over time. So it could alter that permeability using things like channel proteins uh, specific transport proteins and uh, active transport proteins. Just for example, the sodium potassium pump helps with the homeostasis of that resting membrane potential by reducing the interior charge. How does it do that? The NAK pump for every cycle pumps three sodium out and pumps two potassium in. So you have plus three leave, plus two enter, 
which means we get a net of minus one inside uh, uh, for a charge difference for each cycle of each sodium potassium pump. So that's a way in homeostatic regulation of membrane potential, we bump it down if it goes too high. So that's a big deal for the sodium potassium pump. So that's an example of altering permeability. When you activate the sodium potassium pump, you're going to make uh, essentially sodium leave and make potassium come in. So you have changed permeabilities here uh, and you reduce charge. So there you go. Okay, so uh, our little key players are voltage gated channels. Uh, these have two gates and alternate between three states. Um, here we have closed at the resting state, uh, no sodium enters through it. So it is a closed channel. Uh, essentially, um, the activation gate is inactive. Uh, so we're gonna have to essentially, how do we, okay. There is a difference between a closed sodium channel and an inactivated sodium channel. A closed sodium channel Literally, its conformation prevents sodium from entering. So the 3D shape or the conformation prevents sodium uh, from entering the protein. So it just straight doesn't matter what's happening the uh, sodium cannot cross that channel so that's state one right state two uh, the voltage gated sodium channel hits a certain voltage amazingly enough uh, and it opens right so um, Voltage gated essentially just means it opens at a specific uh, membrane potential. A specific voltage. Right? So specifically here, when the difference in charge across the membrane is negative 55 millivolts, these open. So the term depolarization here is important. Okay, so uh, really quickly, we've talked about this before, but here's a graph uh, of uh, our Membrane potential, the difference in voltage. So unit is millivolts, right? And then we have our various values. This is negative 70, our resting membrane potential. Then we're going to have negative 55. This is our voltage gated threshold. Uh, and then we have little landmarks here. Um, here's zero and here's like, I don't know, positive 30, let's say. Uh, and essentially, when we say depolarization, what we have is, a chart showing how membrane potential changes over time. So at rest, you're at the resting membrane potential. Oh, who'd have thunk? Uh, when you start to receive uh, neurotransmitters, 
uh, or maybe a sensory uh, signal, uh, depending on whether or not you're peripheral or central, um, it will start to cause permeability changes. And you'll start to become a little more permeable to positive ions. In other words, positive ions come into the neuron and that causes the charge to go up a little, right? And then you'll hit our voltage gated threshold. Our voltage gated threshold causes boom activation. Uh, so our sodium channel is opened. So our activation gate, our activation gate activates, operates. So the activation gate um allows sodium to pass through uh so the activation gate let's just say kicks on that is very descriptive right we can all imagine that the activation gate kicks on and uh sodium can pass and sodium floods in because sodium is in higher concentration outside the membrane than in. Sodium has a positive charge. So as sodium floods in, the charge of our, uh, the, the membrane potential rapidly, rapidly reaches zero. So it was polarized because there was a difference in charge. So as we approach zero, we call it depolarized. So it depolarizes. Uh, and it will even go up above a zero and the inside will become a little bit more charged than the outside as sodium floods in. And that is another voltage gate threshold. So what does this threshold do you ask? Why? That's pretty easy. Right? This voltage gate, positive 30, kicks on the inactivation gate. So, at positive 30 millivolts, the inactivation gate kicks on. And it straight blocks the sodium channel. This is an important note. See, the sodium channel is still permeable to uh, sodium, right? Our voltage-gated sodium channel could still allow sodium through it. But the inactivation gate literally just clogs up the channel and sodium cannot pass. This is why it's different from closed. In closed, the channel itself is, uh, is shaped in such a way that sodium literally cannot enter it. Inactivated, sodium could pass through, but the channel is blocked, right? Uh, so, you know, um, yeah, uh, the inactivation gate would be when, say, a canal's uh, locks are closed and a boat literally cannot pass. Uh, so a boat could, you know, go through the canal until it hits the lock, but it can't get past there. It's shut. Whereas uh, the closed state might be when that uh, cargo ship had turned sideways in the Suez Canal and... Uh, Literally nothing could get past because the the new shape of the canal with the cargo ship in there uh, meant that cargo ships couldn't get past. There was not a way to open it and allow cargo ships past. It was now newly shaped and just straight couldn't. That metaphor got away from me. Uh, and 
um, very quickly will no longer be a functional metaphor for future classes. Uh, but you know what? Google it. Uh, Suez Canal blocked cargo ship. Yeah. It's always a good metaphor when someone has to Google it. Okay. So we have three states. Uh, the closed state where it literally does not have a shape that allows sodium to pass. The activated state where the activation gate kicks on and sodium freely passes. And the inactivated state where the inactivation gate clunk and closes the sodium channel and sodium is not allowed past. So... Uh, at positive 30, the sodium channel, the voltage gated sodium channel inactivates, the inactivation gate closes, and boom, we are no longer gaining positive charge. Now, we're going to lose charge and even go down below resting potential before getting back up to resting. And now let's talk about how we do that, right? So let's add some numbers here. Uh, here's, uh, you know what? Let's, this is one, this is two, this is three. So here's one, here's two, here's three. And then we have A, uh, whoa, nope, erase. There we go. We have A and B. Okay, so a and B represents the voltage-gated potassium channel. Voltage-gated potassium channel kicks on at a certain charge and kicks off at a certain charge. What are those charges? Well, the kick-on charge is pretty easy. That's plus 30 millivolts. The kick-off charge is hyperpolarization. more of an event than a specific charge. Okay, so this one does not have three states. This one has two states. Um, it is either shaped to allow potassium through or shaped to not allow potassium through. So uh, at plus 30 millivolts, the conformation allows potassium through. Now, we established that potassium is at a higher concentration in the cell versus out the cell. So, when the voltage-gated sodium channel snaps shut, no more sodium comes in, so we're not going to climb and charge anymore. We don't have a positive charge flowing in. Now, when the potassium channel shape changes and it opens, potassium higher concentration in the cell versus out, positive charge exits. And as we lose positive charge, the charge across the membrane goes down, right? And we're going to go below our resting potential. So um, right around and just past the resting potential, so uh, they close, right? So conformation prevents potassium through. Hyperpolarization, right, is this little phase yellow might not have been the best decision but right there 
That's hyperpolarization. Um, and hyperpolarization is when the membrane potential drops below the resting membrane potential. If negative 70 was the polarized resting membrane potential, when it goes to like negative 80, negative 90, I don't have an exact voltage there, but when it goes below negative 70, that is more polarized than negative 70. It is hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarization. And that's when around, ne around negative 70 and into hyperpolarization, that's the area in which the voltage-gated potassium channels snap shut and we stop losing positive charge. And then we have this little interplay between uh, sodium leak channels And leak channels are literally leaky sodium channels. They allow uh, a trickle of sodium into the cell. Uh, and that's how charge goes up. And then we have the sodium potassium pump uh, brings the charge down. It kicks out three positive charges, brings in two positive charges, uh, and it lowers membrane potential. And these two are our homeostasis buddies, essentially. There's also calcium and other ions involved, but these are two really good examples of homeostasis buds because as sodium leaks across, the sodium potassium pump says, hey, hey, too much sodium and kicks some out. One of those nice little mwah, symmetrical almost examples. Sodium leaks in, so we kick sodium out. Mm, not worrying about whether or not calcium or potassium or sodium or various different ions are rolling around there. It's just directly sodium comes in, sodium pushed out. That's nice. That's a, a simple homeostasis. We love it. Okay. We love it, folks. Okay, never mind. Uh, by the way, just uh, depolarization is the charge going up repolarization is the charge going down. So repolarization is when we go from plus 30 to negative 70. Depolarization is going from negative 70 to plus 30. Hyperpolarization is when we go below negative 70. Charge differential becomes greater than negative 70. Okay, so uh, there we go. Um, not too bad. And that's just the text, which I literally just did. So, uh, you know, who cares? Boop. Uh, there's a picture, but I did it better. There's a thing, but I also did it better. So one, two, three, four, five. But I think... A and B was a better use of my time because, well, uh, yeah, so, well, I guess, uh, really, this should be three and four. At any rate, here we go. The events of an action potential at one, right, the sodium channels uh, are their conformation prevents sodium from entering.
and the potassium channel prevents potassium from leaving. At two, the sodium channels become active and <clears throat> sodium passes in, potassium channels are still closed, inactive. At three, during repolarization, the inactivation gate kicks shut. We can no longer uh, flood sodium in, potassium floods out. No more positive charge coming in, positive charge exiting. We drop down and we repolarize. And then around four, uh, we're going to be near that potassium voltage threshold that's going to cause the potassium channel to shut. Uh, you can see four is in the process of going from hyperpolarization to resting membrane potential. So the picture has it open. Um, so, uh, you know, forgive that. Um, and once you reach, uh, four, we go from inactivation gate shut to conformation prevents travel. So here around four, as we get to resting membrane potential, once we hit resting potential, potassium channel shuts and such. So I suppose I should put comma one. Ta-da, oh, no, whoops. I did it the wrong way. Three, uh, oh. I did it the wrong way here. Wow. Boop. My brain was just wanting to do it, you know, in such a way uh, that the numbers crawled left to right. Anyway, there we go. Ta da! Okay. Not too terrible. And then again, voltage gates. Ta da! Ta-da, and then that's hyperpolarization. Ta-da! Action potential characteristics. So now that we've talked about how an action potential occurs, let's talk about the actual anatomy of them. So this is our little uh, index, our table of contents for what we're going to talk about, the basic properties of action potentials. Uh, and let's get started. So first off, let's talk about a threshold stimulus. So what does it mean when we say threshold stimulus? Well, it's very easy. A threshold stimulus is literally negative 55 millivolts. In other words, uh, a stimulus... must reach negative 55 to cause an action potential and as a corollary of that, uh, if negative 55 millivolts is hit and those sodium channels open, an action potential always occurs. So if you do not reach the threshold, which is that voltage gated sodium channels popping open, um, if you do not reach that threshold, then no action potential, not a partial, not a little bitty, no, no action potential whatsoever. Under negative 55, no action potential. Negative 55 action potential, guaranteed. There's no way to pull it back and stop an action potential. If you hit threshold, an action potential occurs. So where does a threshold stimulus occur? A threshold stimulus occurs in the cell body and the dendrites. An action potential on the axon, you don't have to worry about threshold. Once an action potential reaches the axon, uh, it will automatically carry all the way down. However, along the dendrites and the cell body, 
threshold must be reached in order to depolarize the membrane and help generate an action potential. So it, a local depolarization, right? This describes a change in membrane potential, right? It may or may not reach threshold. A local depolarization may or may not reach threshold. If it reaches threshold, you get an action potential. So when we say local, action potentials have to travel the membrane. In other words, if you get an action potential here, uh, it will then potentially cause an action potential. It will cause membrane depolarization next to it. And that will cause membrane depolarization next to it, which continues a chain of membrane depolarization. And that membrane depolarization continues little local depolarizations that must travel all the way down the membrane along the cell body until you get to the axon hillock. And then once you hit that first segment right there, you're once you hit threshold at that first segment, you're guaranteed. All along the dendrites in the cell body, you can actually have it degrade to subthreshold. It may not maintain threshold as it travels along there locally depolarizing. So uh, this is because there is resistance to charge in the dendrites and there's a resistance to charge in the cell body uh, or a resistance to depolarization in the cell body and dendrites. So it's easier for a depolarization to degrade from threshold to sub-threshold. So a threshold stimulus occurs at around negative 55 millivolts because that kicks on the sodium channels. A sub-threshold potential or a sub-threshold stimulus, no action potential. A threshold stimulus, action potential. Uh, there is either action potential or none, right? So threshold, all or none. You either have a full action potential or you do not. Okay, so if you either get an action potential or you don't, in other words, stimulus, intensity does not affect action potential intensity. This is because there is one action potential intensity. It is you're at resting, you get the little stimulus causing a sodium channel or uh, causing little local depolarizations. You hit threshold, boom, depolarization, plus 30, hyperpolarization, back to there. This is the only action potential. Action potentials are identical. APs are identical. So it's not like you step on a nail and you get a really big action potential or you sort of brush a table and you get a really small action potential. You hit negative 55, you get the same action potential. So stepping on a nail generates an action potentials graph that looks identical to brushing your finger across a table, right? The rubbing my fingers together same action potential as punch in the head. So boot to the head, uh, brush on the cheek, no change in the graph of an action potential. So the question is, how do you feel the difference? How do you feel intensity, right? 
why does a boot to the head feel a little more intense than a brush on the cheek? Well, uh, this is um, potentially affected in multiple ways, right? So uh, when we talk about action potentials being identical, the amplitude is that charge difference. Uh, equals the action potential uh, charge, right? Amplitude is independent of intensity. So how do we tell the difference between a weak stimulus, like a very light brush on the cheek, and a strong stimulus, like a boot to the head? Well, uh, a strong stimuli um, has a variety of ways. Uh, and one of the basic basic ways is how many action potentials over time does it generate, right? Uh, so a strong stimuli will cause more action potentials per unit time than a weak stimuli. In other words, if you get a strong stimulus, so for instance, let's instead of a boot to the head uh, or a brush on the cheek, let's talk about pressure on a table. Uh, if I put my thumb just gently, or how about my cheek, right? Or my nose, right? If I put my finger gently against my nose, uh, light touch, I'll get maybe, let's just go conceptual, right? And we'll say absolutely incorrectly, this gives me 50 action potentials per second. And that's a very light touch right there. And then, I push, oh, and that's a much stronger, intense feeling. Uh, so that might be, I don't know, 200 action potentials per second. And so now I'm getting a lot more action potentials per second uh, for the strong intensity versus the light intensity. So, um, right? That's one easy way to code for strength. A strong stimulus can produce more action potentials per unit time than a weak stimulus, right? Uh, so not too bad. So a cent your central nervous system could then take action potentials per time and translate it into felt or experienced intensity. All right. There's other things that will help code for stimulus intensity. Um, so for instance, uh, number and diversity of sensory receptors triggered. And we'll get into that with senses, but for instance, a light touch on my nose uh, stimulates the light touch receptors in my finger and the light touch receptors of my nose. Oh, whereas when I just jam my finger against my nose, right? Uh, the hard pressure receptors in my fingers are shooting off in addition to the light pressure. So that's telling me there's hard pressure against my nose. At the same time, my nose is getting sensors firing off in both the skin and the cartilage. And I've got special sensors that tell me that my nose is being pushed out of position. So there's positional sensors being activated and there's pain sensors being activated. There's sensors that detect uh, the movement of airflow through my nose. So I know that airflow is being shut off. So now I can integrate those sensors together to tell me what I'm experiencing, right? So that's not so terrible. Uh, there's a number and diversity of sensory receptors triggered. Uh, so boot to the head uh, is also going to generate pain sensors, a lot of them, uh, versus the brush on the cheek.
Um, but this is, uh, that's for sensory receptors. So we're going to talk about the brain and the special senses. Okay, so here's just stimulus intensity showing you a graph, right? Uh, so interestingly enough, if your frequency is too low, all right, if your frequency is too low, uh, might be sub-threshold. It won't even be enough action potentials per second uh, to, or it won't be enough sensory receptors uh, uh, triggered to actually get an action potential fired. Right. We'll talk about how that works when we talk about the graded response uh, when it comes to neurotransmitters and uh, sensory receptors. So, but, you know, here's one action potential, and that is obviously threshold because we got an action potential. And then here's, you know, four action potentials over time. And so that's above threshold. And here's a whole bunch of action potentials over time. And that's very much above threshold. And so we are experiencing these action potentials over time as stronger stimuli. Ta -da! Okay, so that's a basic uh, interpretation of this. Um, now let's talk about conduction velocity, right? So there's a few things that affect how quickly sensory information travels along a neuron. Right. So uh, <clears throat> there is a everything in which current uh, uh, in which charge, uh, you know, how do I put this? Um, ion flow is going to be affected by basic resistance. This is just physics. There's resistance to changes in charge. Right. So, however that might happen with a membrane with specialized proteins and all this other stuff, uh, at its heart, there's a resistance to change in charge. Um, and uh, when you think about it, if you have a large neuron um, versus a, uh, a small neuron, right? Um, there's a difference in resistance. These are uh, roughly circular structures, roughly cylindrical structures, and they're just sort of a, uh, when you look at the physics of resistance, so when you look at the physics of resistance, Uh, in uh, cylindrical structures. There is some very basic like laws of physics stuff going on here. Uh, so what are the basic laws of physics stuff? Um, with a larger fiber, there's lower resistance. So larger fibers lower resistance. The axons can have different diameters. Not all axons have the exact same diameter, right? So a larger axon versus a smaller axon. Large diameter fibers have less resistance to current flow, and because they have less resistance, there's a faster velocity. So, uh, Essentially, you're going to have that ion change crawling across the membrane go a little faster on larger fibers than on smaller fibers, just, just by the laws of physics, right? That's the, the, like, no special protein channel effects here. It's literally the laws of physics. A larger diameter has less resistance, and if there's less resistance, the current flows faster down it. Um, so just universal fundamental physics, right? Uh, and then we have myelination. Uh, so 
an action potential has to crawl down a membrane. And by that, I mean, if you have depolarization in this little area here, it stimulates depolarization in the next area, which stimulates, whoops, depolarization in the next area. So depolarization on one spot does not immediately depolarize, depolarize the entire membrane. And that's because of charge flow. Uh, whereas wiring, electrical wiring, um, when there's a current flow through an electrical wire, it is essentially instantaneous. Um, it's because electrons aren't like flowing along the wire. They're all sort of like connected to each other. And so current is either on or off. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of fun. Um, uh, anyway, mem uh, because we're playing the depolarization game here, there's actually a conductance velocity, right? So big deal here. Uh, so myelination alters this in a really fascinating way, right? So uh, when you have an unmyelinated axon here in purple, my action potential crawls down the whole thing. An action potential stimulates the next action potential over and the next one over and the next one over, crawling down the whole membrane. This is slow conductance. This is an unmyelinated axon. Whereas if we have a myelinated axon, uh, let's make this easier. I'm making too much drawing. This is too much drawing. Here we go. You're going, what the heck is this drawing? It's just I'm putting actual axon in before I get myelin. So if you recall from the beginning, the little bits of exposed axon are nodes of Ramvier. So, uh, and essentially, what happens with our action potential is it does node jumping. An action potential reaches myelin and immediately jumps to the next node and that depolarizes and it jumps to the next node and it jumps to the next node and it jumps to the next node. And, next node. and we clear significant distance, right? This is one, two, three, four, five, six action potentials. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, like double. Uh, and that's even not a drastic enough difference right there. So here we basically almost instantaneously, right? Jump between nodes. It's uh, extremely fast. Extremely fast hopping. All that node jumping goes whoosh, extremely fast. Whereas here, it crawls down the membrane. Right. So jumping between nodes, doing node jumping is also called saltatory conduction. Uh, so this saltatory, con saltatory conduction occurs in myelinated axons only and is extremely fast. Right. So uh, depending on the size of the fiber, I think um, it's like what? I think 
uh there we go uh meters per second um with unmyelinated not uh yeah. unmyelinated neurons We're talking 0 0.5 to like 15 meters per second. Still kind of fast. If you're about, uh, you know, we're like a tall person is, my brother is a full two meters tall and he's six foot six, right? So that's a pretty tall person. At 15 meters per second, that's, you know, uh, one seven and a half seconds, uh, seven and a half seconds to go from top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Uh, and even at 0 0.5 meters per second, that's one second to travel the entire distance of his body. And that would be if there was an unmyelinated neuron that went all the way down. If it didn't have any change in fiber diameter uh, or myelin on the, that path, if it was just straight all the way from the top to the bottom. So this is still fast. Uh, but when you get uh, myelin involved, uh, you're talking 70 to 120 meters per second. Uh, so saltatory conduction, uh, very, very fast. Very fast. So, uh, a very drastic difference, right? So, up to, what, 240 times faster if you're, you know, looking at 0 0.5 meters per second versus 120 meters per second. So, yeah. Um, this is really important because you know 120 meters per second in a two meter person that's like one three hundredth of a second if you had a un, if you had a large diameter myelinated fiber running from top to bottom that's really fast so very important uh, okay so let's talk about types of neurons uh, okay, so we can generally categorize neurons into group A fibers, which have a large diameter. They are uh, myelinated. And they are associate, so they do no jumping, saltatory conduction. And they are associated with somatic sensory and motor fibers. In other words, uh, sending sensory information to the central nervous system and sending responses to the body. So, uh, as you might imagine, getting sensory information is kind of important. You really, really want to know where you're going, what you're smelling, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're stepping on, right? It's kind of important information that needs to get to your brain really fast. So having myelinated fibers carry that, good. And then if you're stepping on a nail uh, and you sense that very quickly, you kind of want to respond very quickly. So having these large myelinated fibers uh, send that response out to lift your foot up, very important. So. There we go. We can contrast the group A fibers with the group B fibers. Uh, so they are intermediate diameter. That is a nice vague term that just means smaller than A, larger than 
C. Somewhere between intermediate. Lightly myelinated. So let's go ahead and finish my, there we go. Okay, finish my group A. And I'll make my nodes really small and my myelin really thick. There we go. So uh, now let's get a group B. There we go. And let's lightly myelinate it. And by that, we'll just make the nodes larger. Like literally, that's, that's what lightly myelinated means. So group A, when we look at that action potential hop, is literally like a very, very small amount of action potentials being generated in the nodes before you reach the, ax the axon, yeah, the terminal bud of the axon. So very fast. So here, there's more membrane to be depolarized, but there's still myelin, so there's still some node jumping. So it's not slow. So uh, we have faster than unmyelinated just less myelin and larger or longer nodes. That's lightly myelinated. Uh, so this is associated with our autonomic nervous system fibers. Uh, so this is both the uh, the um, <clears throat> the I am forgetting. So let's just pop back to like the first slide because everybody makes mistakes. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. So autonomic nervous system is both sympathetic and parasympathetic. These are not restricted to any particular one. Uh, so there we go. So sympathetic and parasympathetic. There we go. Uh, and then here we have the smallest diameter nerves. And they are unmyelinated. So the action potential has to depolarize every last micron of the membrane as it travels down. So it is unmyelinated, so it is significantly slower than A and B. It is the slowest. And again, it's autonomic nervous system associated with the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, it's it's kind of just as a hip shot generalization. Uh, the group B fibers will be going from the spinal cord, uh, sort of, uh, 
medium to long uh, distances, uh, the group C fibers are often little interneurons that sort of uh, connect between um, neurons. So they're short neurons, uh, and that, that makes it okay for them to be slow. So uh, you might have, um, you know, your adrenal, let, let's just, yeah, here's your adrenal gland, right? And uh, it looks like a kidney, but uh, in fact, whoa, come back here. Let's actually, because, yeah, the adrenal gland is literally on top of the kidney. So there we go. There's your kidney hat, which is your adrenal. And you're going to have your uh, spinal cord. Right there. Um, it's actually sort of a mix between A, B, and C. We're not going to worry about that too much. Uh, but you might have a C fiber connecting in there, and then a uh, B fiber connecting here. There we go. So uh, the C only goes a very short distance. Um, and so it's thin diameter because it actually forms uh, little networks along here connecting to other interneurons that go to areas uh, sort of called a plexus. And we're not worried about that at the moment, but they have to be thin so that they can fit this little plexus in here. So, uh, and then you'll have your B fibers going to the other whatchahoosets that do the thingies. So, there you go. Uh, and that's why we have sort of a mix between B fibers and C fibers. And then we have a mix of A, B, and C fibers in the spinal cord, uh, just sort of as a compromise, right? You need to get a lot of stuff running up and down the spinal cord, so it can't all be large diameter neurons. That's just too, uh, it's too low a density of neurons to get everything you need traveling up and down the spinal cord. So some of it can, uh, needs to be myelinated, some of it needs to be lightly myelinated, and then some of it needs to be unmyelinated so that you get that compromise between the amount of signals you can shoot up and down the spinal cord and uh, the speed of signals. So it's, it's a literally just cobbled together from the nervous system you were stuck with as a lancelet. So, you know, the original chordate right here is a little thing that looks gross. There's its tail. Oh, come back here. Whoa. Oh, good news. The pin stopped working. So that's it for now. Uh, and cut. Okay, and we continue on with just a nice graphical thing of A, B, and C fibers, uh, illustrating that, of course, um, the A fibers being thickest, 12 to 20 microns, have a, the fastest conduction velocity because they're myelinated. Uh, the B fibers being intermediate, less than 3 microns, but lightly myelinated means you still get 3 to 15 meters per second. The C fibers being less than 1 micron getting you, and unmyelinated gets you the slowest speed. Uh, and you can just see that a larger diameter axon allows for more space for uh, ion flow, which means you basically get that charge difference faster. So having more diameter to just get more circumference so that there's more channels, you know, literally just channels packed in there, uh, 
means that you get a faster flow. And of course, we're at the high for presenter view, but there were no notes there, so you know that I actually knew what I was talking about. So, uh, smarty over here. All right, continuing forward, we talk about conduction velocity. Uh, so, why do myelin sheaths actually help uh, with conduction velocity? What's the physics of that? Um, so, fat is an insulator. Fat insulates. And with regards to charge, fat prevents a leak uh, uh, of uh, ions. Wherever there's fat, ions can't leak and we can't have, uh, it prevents degradation and uh, that prevention, prevention of leak, that prevention of degradation causes that node jumping. We don't want to have to get too deep into the physics of it. So uh, not just because I'm not prepared to get too deep in the physics of it, but because that's not part of the purview of this uh, anatomy and physiology class. So, oh, oh, oh. Uh, so, saltatory conduction occurs at the nodes of Ranvier. Literally, I've said it a hundred million times. That's where the de depolarizations occur, which means that's where the channels are, and it's no jumping. Ta-da! So, there we go. Um, and we can see here a good example of uh, at the dendrite or the cell body, we have uh, resistance... to uh, action potential crawling. In other words, a threshold at one portion does not guarantee thresholds all the way down. This might sound odd at first, but it's not odd. It's actually, it, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, so essentially, when you're looking at a dendrite or the cell body, right? So looking at sort of resistance, uh, in order of resistance, uh, the most resistant is the cell body. Uh, the middle resistant is the dendrites. And uh, the lowest is the axon, hillock, and the axon. Um, like I said, once an action potential hits the axon, hillock, and the axon, you're pretty much guaranteed it's causing threshold all the way down. Uh, so why is this a feature, not a bug? Well, Having this degradation that prevents an action potential from starting at the dendrite and going all the way down uh, basically helps to filter low intensity or rare stimuli. You don't necessarily want to respond to every single minute stimuli. You do not want to necessarily respond to 
every absolute single stimuli. So it's actually very useful to have stimuli degrade over time. What's the physics of this degradation? It's, it's actually very simple. Uh, if we were to count the channels, uh, let's start on the dendrites. And then let's go to channels on the cell body. Right, so cell body. Dendrites. And then if you look at the axon, boom, 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 boom. So these are our channels. Uh, so our voltage gated channels are pretty low frequency on the dendrites, extremely low frequency on the cell body. So uh, it's harder to get a local depolarization that manages to go from one set of channels all the way to the next set of channels. Uh, and that literally just sort of filters out uh, low intensity or rare stimuli. So um, you do not necessarily want your body to respond to, like there's sensors that can detect the expansion of the aorta. This is important. If the aorta expands too much, your body has a response to decrease blood volume. Because if it's expanding too much, that means you kind of have too much blood. So, which translates to too much water in your circulatory system. So you pee some out, right? Um, you don't want your body to necessarily expand to or respond with peeing to every bit of expansion, right? It's going to send action potentials as it expands, right? But you only necessarily want it to get you to pee when it hits beyond a certain amount of stretching. Uh, and so by having stimuli degrade over time, like any stretch sends an action potential, but once you hit that magnitude of stretching, you're going to get enough action potentials over time to keep it going, man, keep it going. And that way you only pee out a bunch of water when it stretches too much. That's an example. I honestly don't even know if degradation is how that works, but it is a perfect conceptual example of why that would be a feature, not a bug. So um, you have no or few gated sodium channel or gated channels, sodium or potassium present along uh, sections of the membrane. Uh, and so the voltage decays because of current leak, right? Uh, so you have, you know, uh, leak channels along there uh, for homeostasis uh, and active transport channels for homeostasis. And so uh, by having far between channels, you degrade it over time, and that way only fr uh, certain frequencies will get the action potentials going all the way down. Basically, you get action potential after action potential, which literally basically means you build up enough sodium in there to uh, basically cross the distance between channels, right? If you get enough, enough sodium, so just a little bit of sodium won't allow it to diffuse across. But you get enough sodium packed in there because action potential after action potential keeps opening and reopening the sodium channels. Then you're going to get enough sodium across to threshold the next one over. Uh, so it's, it's literally just you know, filtering. So, hooray! Whereas along the axon, a little bit goes a long way. Boo! So just zap all the way down. Ta-da! That's, that's literally, there's an unmyelinated axon. Uh, you've got 
in a sodium and potassium voltage channels present. So that means action potential triggers all the way down. Voltage do not does not decay, but it has to go all the way down. No saltatory conduction, it's slow. Uh, and then we have the myelinated axon uh, and woo, it gets you going down. So uh, like I said here, I've said this like before, uh, Schwann cell and oligodendrocyte uh, membranes get smushed and it's basically just phospholipids creating that fatty insulation. And so uh, underneath them phospholipids insulated, there's no or very little channel proteins. Uh, it's very fatty. Uh, it's got less proteins though, um, or in that phospholipid. Anyway, you get the idea. It's an insulator. Uh, literally said this before. Awesome insulator, prevents leakage of current, saltatory conduction, much faster, jumps between nodes. I've hit that before, I've hit that before, bop, bop, bop. Uh, and then this is just <laughs> synthesis of all three. Feel free to pause it here, bop. Uh, and here we just got illustration with the known jumping added in there. Feel free to pause. Myelin keeps the current in the axons. Voltage doesn't decay. Action potential is generated only if the nodes jump between nodes. Oh, I've said it all before. Uh, regeneration of peripheral nerve fibers. Okay. So, actually, let me hop back real quick to something I skipped over just so I can get it in before we get into some, like, pathology and damage regeneration. Let's talk about different kinds of neurons. Okay, so this is just basically classification of neurons by uh, feature, like by where the axons are, well, where the cell bodies are, right? Um, so uh, here we go. Multipolar neuron is literally the typical neuron. We just talked, we, we've been talking about it and drawing it the whole time, right? Tons of dendrites up by the cell body axon hillock, long axon, bunch of little separations into a bunch of terminal buds. This is the most abundant uh, and it is literally the most abundant because it is the main neuron of the central nervous system, which there's like billions and upon billions of neurons in there. So since it's the most abundant there, it has to be the most abundant overall. Like literally that's it. It's in the CNS and it's the most abundant there. So um, it also happens to be the motor neuron of choice so that you can get a bunch of muscle fibers off of one neuron because you have a bunch of little terminal bites. So that's nice. Uh, and it allows for, you know, all the basic features we've talked about. Okay, so now let's talk about slightly different neurons. First up is the bipolar neuron. Bipolar neurons are relatively rare and they tend to be relatively short. Uh, and uh, literally, this is multipolar. Uh, so for polarity, uh, we have multipolar literally because there's a bunch of little dendrites coming off the cell body. So you can have it connect up to a bunch of other dendrites. So, ta -da. right, okay, so there you go. You have multiple dendrite connections. Look at that. Uh, so here, the bipolar neuron, literally instead of a cell body on one end with a bunch of little dendrites and axons, yeah not dend whatever, you know what I mean. A bunch of axons connecting up to one dendrite. Or, oh gosh, I'm getting so tired, people. A bunch, the dendrite is on one end, so we have polarity, it's far away from the axon. It's multipolar, because we have a whole bunch of dendritic branches branching out from the cell body which means a whole bunch of axons from other cells can connect. 
So we have this multipolarity because we have a whole bunch of different axons connecting into one cell body through all those different branching dendrites. Here, it's a bipolar neuron because the cell body is in the middle and we have an axon coming from one end and then a sort of pseudo axon coming from the other. I say pseudo axon, it's essentially one dendritic extension coming from one side, one axon extension coming from the other cell body in the middle. So two extensions on either side bipolar. There we go. Not too bad. All right. So these are rare. They tend to be short. Uh, and they are sensory neurons, pretty much restricted to sensory neurons found in the retina, the nose, and the inner ear. Great place to have relatively short little uh, neurons. They're often go-betweens between the sensor and a larger nerve. So uh, they don't have to be long, which means it's okay. All right. Um, and you can see from the picture... Uh, tend to be unmyelinated, which, again, short, so they don't necessarily need to be myelinated. They're often an interneuron. So uh, a neuron connects to a little bipolar neuron, which then connects to another neuron, uh, which is why they're short. They're the middleman. Unipolar neuron. The cell body extends off of our branching thing, which means we essentially have one extension, right? We do not necessarily have a uh, obvious bunch of dendrites sticking off of the cell body. There's no uh, dendrites sticking off of the cell body. Instead, we have some receptive ending, endings over here which are essentially serving the function of the dendrite. And we have the terminal buds of the axon over here. And essentially the entirety of the cell is axon. So very well myelinated, very quick transfer. So uh, it's a sensory neuron from the periphery to the central nervous system. Again, you kind of want that sensory information quickly. Uh, it's in the dorsal root ganglia of the brainstem, um, and it's part of the sensory, uh, sensory ganglia of cranial nerves. Again, you want uh, sensory information getting to you fast. You want brainstem information processed fast. Uh, like, for instance, your brainstem is associated with breathing. It's associated, I talked about the expansion of the aorta. Your brainstem is associated with that. Uh, so it gets a lot of very important autonomic sensory information. Uh, so that afferent information has to get there quick and be processed quick and send out responses quick. So you got myelin all the way down instead of having dendrites that are essentially unmyelinated or, you know, instead of having that resistance to current, having to go all the way down the dendrite and then all the way down the cell body, it's adapted. So blam, all the way down very fast. So, uh, there you go. Um, not too terrible. So, uh, when we classify these, I've said sensory, I've said afferent, I've said motor a bunch. So here we go, just the text for it. Sensory neurons are sending information from sensory structures to the brain. They are afferent. Motor neurons are efferent. The brain sends information out, so it exits the central nervous system, efferent, e for exit, and sends it to the effectors, which are essentially muscles or glands. Uh, and then we have the little interneurons, which are, you know, doing that middleman job, right? So you have a neuron of the spinal cord. There we go. 
Uh, so up here we've got a cell body uh, and we're in the spinal cord, sure why not. Uh, and then you wanna send a little, uh, send a little signal and you hit that little, you know, beep, 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 cell body there. There we go. And beep, 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 beep. There we go. And then you get the beep, beep, beep. Beep. There we go. Uh, and that makes this little middleman right here an interneuron. Ta da! Okay, so. Associated with making the networks, most are in the central nervous system. Remember that the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. So uh, there we go. Not too terribly. Okay, so now we, uh, we've we classified some neurons. We've talked about charge. We've talked about all that stuff. Um, oh, and I kept it in presenter view, so you got to see all my notes on the right and see that I don't necessarily have everything memorized. Rookie move, Heckman. Rookie move. All right. Pew. And now we're going to make sure that I look good. Okay. So let's talk about what happens when a nerve gets severed or damaged. Uh, so, not a great time. Um, so let's say blah, you suffer damage to a nerve. Uh, you could have, you know, like potentially a small amount of damage, sort of severing a portion of the membrane, or you could sever the whole axon. It could be a short bit of damage. It could be a thick bit of damage. So you could have difference in length of damage. Uh, you could have difference in severity of damage. You could have difference in number of damaged sites. So uh, length of damage, uh, number of damage sites, right? So either way, you have a problem when there's damage. And that problem is that neurons on their own are amitotic. A being the Latin for without. So mature neurons do not undergo mitosis themselves. Um, so let's talk about what happens if, if the cell body is intact, right? So here we are not talking about what happens if the cell body is damaged, because if the cell body is damaged, it's a bad time. If the cell body is intact, there's a, a potential for regenerating the damage to the axon. So if the cell body is intact, you might have regeneration of the axon. And essentially those Schwann cells that create the myelination literally just extend into a tube. So if you have some damage here, uh, and you've lost, say, that much of a nerve, then they will extend outward and provide a pathway, right? So there we go. <coughs> Severed. <coughs> Busted. And by growing this regeneration tube, you guide the newly forming axon through the tube and it makes it easier to reconnect, right? So this would be recovery of full function. Um, 
So uh, recovery of partial function could happen for a number of reasons. Um, so perhaps your tube wasn't quite right. There we go. Right, so here the axon regenerates but only a portion gets through, right? That's going to affect current flow. Uh, a lot of this, uh, so that might be partial function. And this is just on an individual axon level. And then if you don't recover function, it's literally just because like they missed each other, bro. The tubes didn't guide them together. No. They'll never meet again. Oh, sad. So this is at the individual axon level. Uh, you could also have any of these occur in different concentrations within a circuit, right? Because obviously when you look at nerves, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, just a ton. So... When we go back, back to the beginning and look at the nerve, right? A bunch of, a bunch of axons within a single nerve. So if there's damage across that nerve, right? You're going to get differential healing of axons across that nerve. You could have partial reconnection of a bunch of them, no reconnection of a bunch of them, full reconnection of a bunch of them, or some mix in between. And that's going to affect how much recovery you get from that regeneration. So, dur you go. Not too bad. Um... So this is, uh, this has a lot to do with so Schwann cells right here. Schwann cells are peripheral nervous system. So uh, this is important because this regeneration bit kind of primarily restricted to the peripheral nervous system. Uh, damaged axons in the central nervous system facing a little bit of a challenge. And that's that in the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes that do all that myelination literally inhibit, uh, inhibit fiber regeneration. Um, there's a number of reasons this could happen. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily adaptive to inhibit fiber regeneration. But if you think about it, there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, reconnect to the wrong circuit, right? If you regenerate, you could potentially cross, uh, cross circuit. Uh, and you could mess with the different circuits there. Um, so in this case, in the central nervous system, when these neurons are amitotic, what you get going is uh, you have a, a low, uh, a, a very low concentration. So in the CNS, you have a very low concentration of neuronal stem cells. And essentially, what you have to do is slowly, because it's a low concentration, regen, uh, produce fresh, fresh neurons. And they have to slowly integrate into existing circuits, existing damaged circuits, 
or create new circuits that bypass the damaged circuits. This would be why nerve damage in the peripheral nervous system heals much more readily than nerve damage in the central nervous system. In other words, brain damage, brain damage uh, heals slower than nerve damage. Uh, so there you go. Um, and that's because in the central nervous system, you can't just create tubes and regenerate axon. Uh, and there's a number of different reasons why that could be with me just hypothetically talking about how you could potentially cross circuit. Whether or not that bears out in the research, I'm just demonstrating by hypothetical example why it might be advantageous to inhibit axon regeneration. So there you go. Okay, uh, now let's talk about just shifting right back into action potential stuff because this is messily organized. Uh, let's talk about refractory periods. Uh, so when you look at a neuron, right, uh, there is a refractory period. A refractory period is the time uh, in which new action potentials cannot fire. That is a refractory period. An absolute refractory period means uh, absolutely no, read my lips, no new action potentials. Where a relative action uh, potential, yeah, a relative refractory period means new action potentials possible, but more difficult to fire. And that's literally because uh, of ion issues. So, uh, so what does the relative period look like versus the absolute period? Uh, we need our action potential graph. And that way, we can talk about where that is. So, boom, boom. So, there we go. There's our resting membrane potentials. All right. Here's the opening of the voltage gated sodium channels. There's the closing of the voltage gated sodium channels and the opening of the potassium gated channels. Uh, and then here's uh, the region when you have the potassium gated channel. Oh, that doesn't look nice. Uh, well, there we go. Here is the region in which the potassium gated channels snap a shot. There we go. So, resting. Right. Uh, threshold. Um, other threshold. There we go. Ta-da! Okay, what does it look like? Well, essentially, the absolute refractory period, the period in which you absolutely cannot generate a new action potential, essentially begins when you go above resting and all the way to about sort of halfway through uh, repolarization. So you absolutely cannot generate 
new action potentials. Whereas the uh, relative refractory period is, you know, in that region where you've got, you know, the sodium channels pretty much all shut down at this point, the potassium channels open uh, all the way through back to resting. And this is our relative. And the reason it's difficult to generate a new sodium, a uh, new action potential has a couple of things. One, um, to generate a new action potential, you have to get positive ions flooding in, right? So when you're in that region where the potassium channels are open, you're losing charge. So it's harder to get enough positive ions flowing in to compensate for that and get to a uh, threshold. And then during hyperpolarization, while you're not losing uh, positive charge anymore, you do need more positive charge because you're below resting. So it's just harder to generate a new action potential. So the absolute is the time span between the opening of the voltage gated sodium channels until they're, you know, mostly back to the closed state. Uh, they've mostly gone from inactivation to shaped so that sodium literally cannot enter. Uh, so that means all action potentials are all or none. Um, and that means action potentials cannot go backwards. You cannot get the channel, uh, you cannot go from threshold uh, up um, and then have it fall back down from threshold. Uh, so when we say one way, we means if it's going positive, you're going to go all the way through. You're not going to have it fall back down. Uh, and that just has to do with the voltage gating, right? Uh, because the voltage gating only opens at certain points and closes at certain points. Once they're open, you're guaranteed uh, that they're going to you know, stay open until a certain threshold and close at a certain threshold. And that way you don't have the charge go up to threshold, go above threshold, and then suddenly fall back down, right? Uh, so action potentials are all or none. And one way means the charge doesn't fall off during the action potential. Relative uh, follows the absolute. Most sodium channels are back to resting uh, and some potassium channels are still open. So we're still losing ions. So repolarization is occurring uh, all the way through, you know, hyperpolarization until you get back to resting. Uh, and that means the threshold for action potentials is elevated because you need more positive ions coming in to get to the voltage gate that allows sodium channels to reopen. Uh, so it generally requires a very strong stimulus. In other words, you need a sensory stimulus that pops a lot of channels across a bunch of dendrites in order to get enough action potentials to open enough channels to get you back to the negative 70 and, or, or, and then back to threshold. So, ta-da! This is another way to filter for very strong stimuli. A very strong stimuli will generate more action potentials per second than is possible if you're just getting a full action potential with a full refractory period and then another full action potential. You can pack them in closer together if you're able to exceed that elevated threshold threshold. <laughs> I'm so tired. Okay, so there, a picture. Pause it if you want. There, a picture of full refractory periods. An action potential goes beginning to end without refiring. Ta-da! Synapses! All right. Synapses! Uh, synapses are junctions between excitatory cells 
So here in the nervous system lecture, we're talking neuron to neuron junctions. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about sensor to neuron junctions. Although sensor to neuron junctions are going to operate essentially off of the same concept of a chemical synapse. They're just, uh, some of them are mechanical, uh, which is fun. Anyway, a chemical synapse, right? Whether it's neuron to muscle, like we learned in the muscle lecture, or neuron to neuron, they're chemical synapses. And what do we mean by chemical synapses? Uh, instead of the neuron, does not directly connect to the other neuron. Instead, uh, action potentials uh, are transmitted between or transmitted across the junction via chemicals and those chemicals are neurotransmitters because they're coming off of a neuron so neuro and they're going across a synapse so transmitter oh wow language makes sense i'm getting so tired so uh, at the event, at events at a chemical synapse, right? The neurotransmitter crosses. So we have vesicle. Then we have uh, vesicle at the terminal bud. Right? The action potential reaches terminal bud. Right. Um, I'm going to mention it in a moment, but instead of just sodium uh, at the terminal bud, something special happens. But ultimately, uh, you have a depolarization and the vesicle secretes neurotransmitters into the synapse. So do, 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 there's neurotransmitters in. And the vesicle secretes it into the synapse. Do, 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 uh, receptors on, uh, dendrite because axons connect to dendrites, bind the neurotransmitters, and there's a receptor binding to a neurotransmitter. And then uh, the um, receptor neurotransmitter complex generates a, oh God, did I just run out of space? My pen just died. A graded response. What is a graded response? Wait, no, it could just be because I lost the pen. Oh, oh, oh. no, I lost the pen completely. A graded response. Uh, a graded potential on the membrane. Uh, a graded potential means that it is, there's our threshold, sub-threshold. So why is that advantageous? Uh, it essentially means you need more receptors 
uh, bound to more neurotransmitters to actually build up to an action potential. So, uh, and then you reach threshold. Uh, so instead of writing threshold, I'll put negative 55. And there's negative 70. Right, so there you go. Um, the more receptors bound to the more neurotransmitters in a synapse or across multiple synapses, the more easily you build to threshold. Uh, and if you have multiple synapses across one single neuron building to threshold, so the more receptors building to threshold, the more frequent your action potentials. Uh, and so you can get more action potentials over time. Um, within a single synapse. And then the more different synapses you get sending action potentials, the greater the change across that whole spance of dendrite, which means you get a greater response. And that's gonna be summation, which we'll talk in a second. Um, you can actually have different kinds of potentials here. Those graded potentials can go two ways. They can be an excitatory response. So an excitatory postsynaptic potential. In other words, postsynaptic means on the dendrite on the other side of the synapse, postsynaptic. The potential means the change in charge. Excitatory means the charge is going up. We're not reaching threshold because it's graded but it's still going up, so it's very exciting. And we can have a inhibitory postsynaptic potential, meaning hold your horses, fella, and the charge goes down. And they essentially, an EPSP cancels an IPSP, and whether or not you sum up, whether or not you get your potentials up to threshold is kind of like, is your total number of excitatory postsynaptic potentials more than inhibitory postsynaptic potentials enough to reach threshold? It's literally additive, right? If you need 10 excitatory potentials to reach threshold, if there's no inhibitory, you just need 10, right? If there's five inhibitory, those five cancel five excitatory, and you need five more. So now you need 15 excitatory. If there's 10 inhibitory and 10 excitatory, you're not building anywhere, fella. If there's 20 inhibitory and 10 excitatory, well, even if you get 10 more, you're not going anywhere. So we can shut down the propagation of an action potential or we can propagate an action potential and as literally that's the heart of the circuits in the brain firing action potentials and going through different circuits because an axon may connect to multiple different dendrites on multiple different neurons and you don't want every single one of those neurons to fire so you might get inhibitory coming in to cancel out an excitatory coming in so that it only goes to the right neurons. Ha ha, ho ho, ho ho, there we go. So we call summation uh, within one synapse over time, temporal summation. Uh, when we say the sum of graded potentials across multiple synapses, in other words, in different areas within a neuron, that's spatial summation, and it's all about whether or not you propagate an action potential, uh, literally additive. And I think I can just get through this. Uh, by the way, vocab, okay. The classic drawing of a synapse is an axon connected to a dendrite, and that's called an axodendritic synapse. Axo for axon, dendritic for dendrite. Axodendritic, axon connected to dendrite. Uh, then you have the axosomatic synapse, and that's where the axon connects to the cell body. So the soma of the cell. Oh, so what? We're just portmanteauing anatomical terms. Woo! 
So here's where the axon connects up to the cell body and we just sort of bypass uh, some of that resistance that we have to buy, like we have to overcome the resistance of the dendrites, then the cell body before reaching the hillock and then the axon. So by going axosomatic, you skip the resistance of the dendrites and it's a little easier to get the uh, action potentials to the synapse or it's a little easier to get the action potentials to the axon. <laughs> then there's axo axonic synapses where you basically connect up to the hillock in the first segment. And that's just basically insto transfer if it's excitatory enough, like you do not have, you bypass all the resistance and you just get to that Threshold means threshold all the way down. So, ta-da, that's some vocab. I don't even need to write anything because the words make sense. And I'll give you like, you, you can pause it to write that stuff down right there. Just just go back some seconds and pause it and write some stuff and then pause it. You know, I'm going fast because, blah. Okay, chemical synapses, specialized for release of neurotransmitters. We talked about that. Axon terminal is the presynaptic neuron. Receptor region is the postsynaptic neuron. Literally talked about that already. This is just the vocab uh, where we were talking about the vesicles are that get released into the synapse. The vesicles are in the presynaptic neuron because it's, you know, before the synapse. The receptors that buy into the neurotransmitters and the postsynaptic neuron because that neuron is after the synapse. So we go across the synapse from presynaptic to postsynaptic. Ta-da! Okay. Uh, and then here's just a nice little diagram of literally everything I said with, remember I mentioned that there's a little slight difference in ion channels when it comes to stimulating a vesicle, right? So, um, when that action potential hits the terminal bud, right? So the action potential arrives at the axon terminal, the terminal bud. Instead of just popping open more sodium channels, right? We trigger vesicles and that requires a different channel. In order to trigger a vesicle, and that, uh, we have to pop calcium channels. So here, Voltage-gated calcium channel. Literally, there you go. That's m, d. Nothing more need be said. It's just voltage-gated. We know voltage-gated. So a calcium channel pops open and calcium pops into that terminal bud. And the calcium is what excites those vesicles and cause the vesicles to pop their particular neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft, which is the proper term for the space between, um, you know, reference that one song, the space between, uh, then the neurotransmitters diffuse across from high concentration at the vesicle to low concentration at the postsynaptic receptors, uh, and they bind to the receptors and you get graded, uh, potentials and, uh, basically here in order to stop graded potential, because as long as that receptor is bound, as long as that receptor is bound, continuous graded potentials are generated. Receptor binds to neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter receptor complex continuously generates graded potentials. You need that to stop at some point. So after X amount of time, after X cellular event, after X action potential event, something happens and the neurotransmitters are removed from the receptors, right? So enzymes could break them down. So an enzyme directly breaks that neurotransmitter into hunks and it's no longer bound, right? Um, 
diffusion, right? You may get enough of a concentration gradient that the concentration gradient strength alone yanks the receptor or yanks the neurotransmitter out of the receptor. So a strong concentration gradient, that could yank it out. Then specific transport proteins could activate and that could pull receptors, uh, pull neurotransmitters out of the receptors and across the membrane. Either way, the postsynaptic neuron or the presynaptic neuron, depending on how diffusion goes, right, uh, gets that stuff across the membrane and recycles it. Pulling the neurotransmitters out of the receptors and out of the cleft that's called reuptake. Reuptake is removing neurotransmitters from the cleft and the receptors. Reuptake stops the response. There's multiple different ways to get reuptake. Ultimately, reuptake stops the response. Then you can recycle your stuff and make more. Ta-da! Okay, so events at the chemical synapse. Literally, this is just the picture again. I don't know why I have it there again. Uh, so, um, channel linked receptors open in response to binding of a neurotransmitter. Ligand is just a general term to something that binds and activates. So a ligand binds and activates the channel protein and ions flow through, and that's your actual graded potential. So uh, this ligand here, that would be our neurotransmitter, essentially. Looks like WT, but then here. Neurotransmitter. So the neurotransmitter is actually what allows the channel to open and gets ion flow. That ion flow, if it's an excitatory postsynaptic potential, has ions flowing in, right? So these might be positively charged ions flowing in. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential might be positively charged ions flowing out. Really just depends on the channel that gets opened up, whether it's sodium, whether it's potassium, whether it's something like calcium, uh, inhibitory causes it to uh, become more negative. Excitatory causes it to become more positive. It's a graded response because these are fundamentally sub-threshold until you get enough together to reach threshold. So there's your graded. This is an excitatory postsynaptic potential sub-threshold. Uh, here's an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Uh, so there you go. Um, graded potentials. You might activate the sodium potassium channel, the sodium potassium pump. No, wait, this is just a sodium potassium channel, not the pump, in which sodium flows in, potassium flows out. Uh, so um, in this case, you're going to have sort of uh, an here you're going to have uh, a bunch of sodium entering. This would get you your excitatory postsynaptic potential. The reason it's sub-threshold is because you lose potassium, which is positively charged. So while you're bringing positive charge in from sodium, you're simultaneously losing potassium uh, so it's, it's not enough of an influx of positive charge to get you to the threshold. If it was just a sodium channel, boom, you'd reach threshold. Uh, but here, 
it's a sodium potassium channel. So it's subthreshold because while you get some positive ions coming in, you lose some positive ions. Just diffusion, baby. Uh, or you could have an inhibitory postsynaptic potential when a calcium chlorine channel opens and you lose positive charge here and you gain negative charge here and ultimately you know the charge drops the potential uh, so here um, you might get uh, and this is literally the action potential which we've talked about a million times before so skipping it all right so graded potentials the strength is determined by the number of i said this the number of neurotransmitters you get enough neurotransmitters to enough receptors you get more graded potentials the time the neurotransmitter is in the area the longer there's neurotransmitters bound to receptors the more graded potentials you get i i said that so um this would be uh your um temporal effects more neurotransmitters at once means more graded potentials at once more neurotransmitters over more time means more graded potentials over time so you could have Uh, you know your time and then each of these could produce an excitatory postsynaptic potential in which case uh, they'd sort of sum up and you might reach threshold very quickly um, or you could have the neurotransmitters bound over time and they just stay there and continue generating the graded and that's the drawing I made there, where they build up over time. Ta-da! Temporal summary. Uh, literally talked about excitatory and inhibitory before. Literally talked about how an excitatory is sub-threshold, but builds you towards threshold. An inhibitory is uh, fundamentally bringing you further from threshold and making it harder to get to threshold. Summation, a single excitatory postsynaptic potential on its own is subthreshold. So you don't get an, uh, you know, an action potential. You get enough of them, you reach threshold. Said that before. IPSPs cancel EPSPs. Said that before. Boom. Temporal. One or more neurons transmits impulses in rapid fire order. Ta-da. Spatial. More terminals at the same time. Literally more synapses than one. So this is at one synapse. Temporal is described at one synapse. Spatial is described at multiple synapses. The ultimate effect at a, at, uh, when you're firing these is a sum of both temporal and spatial. So, ta -da. Uh, literally the same thing. Summation drawings, temporal, a bunch at once, right? Spatial, uh, this is one synapse here. Spatial is multiple synapses. Does not have to be a bunch at once to describe spatial because you get enough on their own to get us a, a threshold, right? Excitatory and inhibitory cancel each other. Ta da! Postsynaptic potential in the summit. Blah. 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 There you go. 
you get enough of them to sum up and you get a graded potential above threshold, you get an action potential. You get enough to sum up and you get a graded potential at threshold, uh, but it's not necessarily quite enough to pop the sodium channels. Graded potential below threshold, no action potential. So this is describing signal degradation. Uh, and we talked about this. This is that uh, feature, not a bug, where going across the dendrites and the cell body causes the signal to, to decrease in strength over time. So action potentials degrade. So you need enough action potentials to keep it going, to build up enough sodium to cross the span between channels. Right? And we literally did a whole thing on that. This is just another drawing. So, ta -da. and here's where you get enough of them, right? So you still get, you always, always get degradation. It's just whether or not you get enough action potentials over time or from enough locations or both to keep the ion the ions flowing in the sodium ions flowing in to build enough action potentials to get across 